This like doesn't feel real. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Ooh. <laughs> wow, the first part of the journey. Yeah. Just the beginning. That's just the beginning, right? Something ends and something begins. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this is this could be the subtitle of this episode. Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair, a global witcher podcast. My name is Alyssa from Good Morin, and I'll be your host as you, I, and our international Hansa accompany Geralt of Rivia and his destiny, Cirilla of Sintra, across the continent. Well, <laughs> this is it. The close of season one of Breakfast in Beauclair. Nearly a year ago, in March, was the first time that I begrudgingly told someone that this podcast was even an idea in my mind. They gave me a little shove and encouragement to get started, and it's wild that a year later, here we are at the last episode of the season. I want to extend a thank you to our guests for season one, Chris, Charlotte, Cyprian, Oleg, Jess, Crisanto, Anita, Carolina, Adi, Luisa, and of course Lars. They took a leap of faith with me by signing on to guest when this was still just an idea. Thank you for your patience, encouragement, and your friendship. And thank you to you, our international company of friends, our Hansa. It's been such an honor getting to meet you all and share this journey together. I can't wait to see you all for season two of the podcast, which will discuss the recently released Netflix series, kicking off on Thursday, June 4, with the end's beginning. During this break between seasons, I'll be celebrating my seventh birthday this Saturday, February 29th, and then I'll hop back into pre-production, recording and editing for seasons two and three of the podcast, compiling and shipping new patron merchandise, taking a family vacation with my parents, filling out our transcript backlog, nurturing the Good Morning account, making short form video and audio content across social, and setting up for a really awesome second season. And before we go, we have new friends in the company to introduce in this episode. I'm excited to share with you Jenny of Ard Skellig, Steph, and Cynthia of Covier, who have become the newest patrons of the show. Shout out to our producer level patrons, Louise of Covier, the owner of the Churlish Porpoise, Eric's the Godling, Katie the Redhead of Toussaint, Jacob B., Mahakam Elder Joe, Julie, Sylvie of Skellige, Jameson, Ava of Gullet, B. Haven of the Edge of the World, Jacob Meeks, and Sebastian von Novigrad. As producer level patrons, they receive an introduction shout out, a spot on the website, monthly bonus content, stickers, a t shirt, an exclusive producer gift from partner Morrison Norris, and producer credits in each and every episode. If you'd like to explore becoming a patron of the show, head over to patreon.com slash breakfast in Beauclair. As for this episode, Larson Witcherflix calls in from Berlin to close out Andrew Sikowski's Sword of Destiny with the final short story, Something More. This episode is special because we revisit many previous episodes and short stories to connect the narrative of destiny between Geralt and his child's surprise, which will serve as the foundation for the five-part saga to come. In Tidings from Toussaint, Lars shares a ton of exciting casting and production news about season two of Netflix's The Witcher. After the episode, head over to R the Hansa and jump into our community discussion of the episode with your thoughts, reactions, or bring up new themes and ideas that we didn't cover. Without further ado, let's get to this episode's short story, Something More. Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair. My name is Alyssa, and returning for the final episode of the season is Lars, also known as Witcherflix, from Germany. Hi, Lars. Uh, hello, everybody. Hey, Alyssa. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. So we were actually supposed to record this episode in Berlin when I was there last weekend. Correct. Um, but we had a little too much fun. So yeah. we were together from, I think, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 10. And then we just looked at each other and we're like, we ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, right. You're right. There's so much to see uh, in Berlin and... Well, I think you had some fun in Berlin, so it was the right decision, I think. So much fun. Um, so it was the two of us. It was my friend, your partner, as well as Cyprian. It was really lovely to be able to, as it always is, to like meet others in person and to actually like see this internet friendship in real life. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And it is always nice to show uh, your town to someone from another country. Cyprian, if you guys know, he was the guest on episodes three and four. He actually took the four of us around on like this walking 
walking tour of Berlin, and it was really, really lovely. He's just so knowledgeable. Was there anything on Cyprian's little walking tour that surprised you that you didn't know about your own city? Well, I'm not a Berlin native, so um, there was lots of things that were new to me too, because, uh, well, I think we were in Berlin Mitte, which is the center of Berlin, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm living uh, in another district, and I'm not every day in Berlin Mitte, so there was lots of things for me to see some uh, squares I haven't seen before, so it was awesome. Hope you're returning soon, of course. Yeah, I would love to. I had a really, really good time. <laughs> uh, and, and you did like the currywurst, right? The currywurst was fantastic. I would highly recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> everyone, has, uh, everyone has to uh, eat a currywurst when you're in Berlin. Very important. <laughs> so now that we've established that I am here in New York, <laughs> I am back, <laughs> and Lars is in Berlin, we're going to be discussing something more today, which is the last short story in Andrew Sikowski's Sort of Destiny. And this takes us to actually the end of the first season of Breakfast in Beauclair. This is it. <laughs> yeah, it went by so fast, but it was so much fun listening and being on your podcast. Oh, I'm glad you were in every single episode. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm glad that you're still enjoying it after 15 episodes too. <laughs> of course, always. <laughs> Something More is the final chapter in Sort of Destiny, and it really ties together a lot of the themes and plot points that we've seen both throughout The Last Wish as well as throughout Sort of Destiny. We've seen Geralt as a protagonist kind of grow and resist this idea of destiny. Something more, we really see the culmination of that resistance. Yeah, it's a short story where everything comes together in the end. All plot lines, uh, all characters, and well, yeah, it's the perfect foundation for what comes next, mainly the five uh, books in the main saga. Yeah, we've got a really long way to go after that. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. many episodes <laughs> of Breakfast in Beauclair to go. Oh lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In part one, the Witcher encounters a merchant in the wilderness, Yurga, who refuses to leave his stuck wagon in the face of danger. As the sun sets, Yurga promises the Witcher, quote, whatever he comes across at home on his return but does not expect, in exchange for his safety and that of his wares. The Witcher defends the pair against a swarm of monsters on the bridge, saving the merchant at his own expense. So the section that opens up the chapter is actually incredibly interesting to me because we get to meet the Witcher in the point of view of a very, very minor character. Um, and this has happened kind of a few times throughout some of the short stories, but I think not as complete and not as holistic as we get in this first section of something more. And I think it's really fascinating because we get to see Jurga kind of process everything about Geralt's existence. Yeah, it's like we uh, get into another perspective especially a very interesting one because, well, he belongs to the small folk of the continent. Rarely in fantasy or in The Witcher, you get the perspective of the common people. And this is especially interesting uh, when somebody really common, really normal, really regular meets Geralt and uh, we see his feelings and his thoughts about this menacing man who, who appears right in front of him. It's very sudden, I think, for this poor merchant, Yurga, because he's in the middle of the wilderness on this bridge in the middle of nowhere and then all of a sudden Geralt rides up and it's just like hello <laughs> yeah right classic Geralt <laughs> not really <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> okay like I said we don't always see Geralt or even his fights from the perspective of someone who's just an average Joe we really get to see the disparity of skill set of familiarity with the supernatural because we're with Yurga for the entire fight. Basically, Geralt rides up. He's like, "What? What are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here? Don't you know how dangerous it is?" And Yurga just says back, "He's like, but I'm not going to leave my stuff. This is a whole year's worth of work. I'm not leaving it behind." And Geralt just kind of grumbles, and he's just like, "Uh, fine. I'll like help you." <laughs> <laughs> It's really interesting, I think, that uh, while well, this whole chapter takes place on a bridge, you definitely get the feeling that Yoga is trapped between, I don't know, the dangers that lurk in the dark, and now there's this strange, uh, dangerously looking man uh, coming straight to him. Very menacing feeling you get when you're reading this, especially because you have the perspective of Yoga. It does seem that by asking for Geralt's help, he is taking almost the lesser of two evils. Yeah, absolutely. And there's this thing that happens when Geralt actually decides to help Yurga. And again, this is taking the themes of the Last Wish and Sword of Destiny full circle. Yurga begs Geralt to save him and save his stuff. And he says, I'll give you whatever you want, whatever you ask, just save me. Geralt stops and he says, what did you say? You'll give me whatever I ask for. Say it again. Yurga just gets very nervous and he starts fantasizing about all these things that Geralt could ask for. Anything and everything. And he's like, none of that is as bad as losing all of my work for a year. 
So he agrees to give the Witcher whatever he asks for. But then there's this very interesting moment where we see Geralt, again, from the perspective of Yurga. He says, what am I doing? What the fuck am I doing? Well, so be it. I'll try to get you out of this, though I don't know that it won't finish disastrously for us both. But if I succeed, in exchange you will, you will give me whatever you come across at home on your return, but do you not expect. Do you swear? It just says, Yurga groaned and nodded quickly. It's the good old law of surprise all over again. It is. And this is not the first time that we have heard Geralt recite these words. Nope. We were first introduced to the law of surprise in episode four, Question of Price, which was with Cyprian. At that time, Dooney had requested the law of surprise from Calanthe's husband, which is why Pavetta became Dooney's child surprise. By the end of the chapter, Geralt had requested the law of surprise of Dooney. Again, now we see this all the way at the very end of the short story compilations with Geralt invoking the Law of Surprise onto Yerga. After Yerga accepts the Law of Surprise, Geralt takes elixirs and he fights the swarm of monsters. It's the classic uh, Sapkowski fight descriptions. Lots of action, uh, lots of danger, lots of, well, blood, of course. Well, what is very interesting in this fight is Sapkowski never describes the monster he's fighting. He doesn't give these monsters a name. Well, as many of uh, your listeners might know, I have an Instagram page. And I think this is one of the most uh, frequently asked questions on my Instagram page. What monsters is Geralt fighting in something more? I have no actual idea. Well, do we have this descriptions here somewhere? Yeah, I do have the description here. Awesome. <laughs> the monsters that Geralt fights are described as small misshapen forms, less than four feet tall, horribly gaunt like skeletons. They stepped onto the bridge with a peculiar heron-like gait, feet high, making staccato jerky movements as they lifted their bony knees. Their eyes beneath flat, dirty foreheads shone yellow, and pointed little fangs gleamed white in wide, frog-like maws. We hear that they're just very fast, and then one of them also has a hand, which is like a chicken's foot. And that's kind of the description that we get. Yeah, uh, actually it doesn't matter what uh, monsters these exactly are, because, well, it's about Geralt fighting, and not being so successful, I would say. Uh, you mentioned the fog, of course. Maybe you can tell from this that this uh, might be fogless. We know them from the games. Or maybe because of their height, maybe they might be knackers. But, well, it's not that important, of course, uh, to give these monsters a name. It's much more important what actually happens during this fight. Yeah, and it's not pretty. <laughs> no, <laughs> especially for Geralt. Geralt does fight these monsters. Ultimately, they pull him off the bridge, which is where he finishes the fight. For a very long time, Yurga just hears the sound of like a massacre going on and then just silence. Eventually, Geralt makes his way back onto the bridge. He's walking with a limp. He's clearly injured, kind of out of it, and he just collapses on the bridge. Except maybe for the uh, Striga fight in the very first short story, it might be one of the few occasions where Geralt is, well, actually kind of defeated by monsters he's fighting. And we'll see Geralt coping with this injury for the rest of yeah, the chapter. Yeah, right. In part two, we see the aftermath of the fight. Yurga and his servants desperately attempt to care for the unconscious Witcher and seek medical aid. Geralt suffers from heavy blood loss and only utters a single name, Yennefer. In part three, Geralt falls into a fitful sleep and dreams of a night at Beltane with Yennefer. This is, uh, I think, a meeting lots of readers have been looking forward to since uh, A Shard of Ice. Well, it starts again, of course, with Geralt uh, drifting in and out of consciousness before we actually see uh, Yennefer in a flashback or in a dream. He's definitely hallucinating, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. It's not only a dream, it must be well a mixture of uh, blood loss, And uh, the elixirs, maybe he was uh, he had been taken. Yeah, I mean, Geralt wakes up on Yorga's cart, takes a potion, eventually falls back asleep. And as Lars said, this is where we get this huge flashback sequence. Beltane is also known as Mayday Eve. Do you have more information about this? Because I only know a little bit. Yes. <laughs> In fact, I've looked something up because Beltane, uh, the festivities surrounding them are quite popular in Germany. I don't know if it's the case in Eastern or Central Euro European countries, but I think I would say so. Well, Betain is a Celtic or Gaelic word, and it's the classic May Day festival uh, with bonfires all over the place. The purpose of these festivities is to scare away the winter and to welcome uh, summer and spring. Well, it's uh, the night from April 13th to May the 1st, and uh, in Germany you have something called Tanz in den Mai, well, roughly translated, uh, dance into the month of May. 
Well, this means that you go dancing, have a party, have a good time, stuff like that, of course. And uh, well, these festivities are linked to something called the Walpurgis Night. Have you heard about that? I don't know if this is something uh, you've heard about outside of Germany. Uh, no, but maybe I should take a trip back to Germany yeah, in April. <laughs> of course. When I was a child, I was always kind of scared about Walpurgis Night because uh, this is the day when witches and demons meet. Oh, sick. Yeah, uh, it is said that they meet on the Brocken Mountain, which is right in the center of Germany in the Harz Mountains. And well, the witches meet, the demons meet, they have orgies, celebrate the devil and uh, dance like crazy and have parties. And well, they do all the stuff. This is definitely not suitable for people under 18. So, <laughs> so you have to watch out around this time in Germany. Of course, during this time, we also have these bonfires and big fires all around the places where you have a drink and meet each other, where we also have a, a thing called a Maibaum, which uh, uh, translates to May tree or Maypole. Especially in the rural parts of Germany, you find May trees, which are erected at the town square, at the market square. And on the 1st of May, people are dancing around this pole or this tree. And there are processions and bands playing music. And of course, uh, drinking beer and eating sausages, you know, like the cliche German stuff. And after that, well, this so-called Tanz in the Mai dance into the month of May starts. You know, there's lots of festivities in Germany around this uh, time of the year. So uh, when I read this story, I uh, knew what uh, Sapkowski was talking about because I've actually been to uh, a festival like that before. I mean, I know that you said some things to try to curb me from going, but the more you say, the more I want to go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you only have to be aware of the witches. Okay, noted. But the rest, yeah, the rest sounds awesome. Okay. So. I'll keep that in mind. I'll book my ticket and I'll keep that in Absolutely. mind. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting to see... Geralt in a setting like this, which, at least within the context of the Witcher worlds and lore, represents, I think, as you also said, spring, nature, the renewal of change, the coming of seasons, fertility, all that fun stuff that you associate with the spring. In the very beginning, Geralt doesn't really know why he's there. He's just like, well, why not? Why shouldn't I be here? Why can't I enjoy myself? And then that kind of comes to a halt when he sees Yennefer. Mm -hmm, of course. <laughs> What can you expect? And we do know that this is a bit of time since they last saw each other, according to Geralt's one year, two months, and 18 days. And for the rest of the section that follows, it just becomes this very interesting portrait of Geralt's and Yennefer's relationship in, I guess, one of their quote-unquote off periods. Presumably, the last time that they saw each other, it was either a shard of ice or another point in time that just didn't really go very well. And they're meeting again, unexpectedly, This is such a heavy section for the two of them because you kind of see them almost fossilized in age, but being kind of surrounded by this night of revelry and fleetingness. And there's like this very stark contrast between how the world moves around them and then their stagnant place within it. Yeah, I think this is what makes this chapter so interesting because of this uh, juxtaposition. Is this a word? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, that is a, <laughs> that is a perfect word. <laughs> okay, uh, because of this juxtaposition of the, yeah, as you said, the festivities, uh, the drunk people, the joy, the happiness. And then you have this uh, stern and serious uh, conversation between uh, Geralt and Yennefer that just uh, summarizes their story perfectly. Even in later books, you could put this uh, chapter or parts of this chapter and it would perfectly fit in. This entire chapter is from Geralt's point of view. We do get a lot more dialogue from Yennefer. I think, as you said, like it summarizes the complex nature of the relationship. We get to see how their dynamic works. So, for example, like she has a tendency to read his mind. Geralt says she needs to make an effort to do it. But in the dialogue, she says, sorry, it's automatic. I can't help it. So we as a reader don't really know what's true and what's not. I think we'll never really understand the true dynamic between them. We see here the recurrence of the theme from the Bounds of Reason, where Yennefer was desperately in want of a child. Yeah, it all comes together. The themes from the uh, short stories come together in something more. Yeah, I think uh, especially in this chapter, the dialogue feels very realistic because we only have these short answers and short questions. It kind of describes the state of the relationship a bit. I at least got the feeling that they have to tell each other a lot of different things. But on the other hand, they, they just can't. They go back and ask 
very short questions with very short answers. And it's very, as I said, realistic. And this is what makes uh, Geralt's and Yennefer's relationship so interesting. Yeah. I mean, as we saw, even in A Shard of Ice with Charlotte, their relationship just ends up being this huge dance of authenticity, half-truths, words said and words overheard in someone else's mind. It's a very complex dynamic. You know, comparatively, (laughs) normal human relationships are simple because you get what's said and you get what's unsaid. But here there's the levels of like the independence that they have, their place in society, their questionable open relationship. And these are people who they have a much longer lifespan than everyone around them. So this dynamic can play out in a hundred different permutations for however long that they really want it to. Uh, Yeah, they have experienced much more than us as regular persons with a regular lifespan. And of course, if you experience lots of things, you get much deeper, much more complicated, much more layered. And this is reflected here again. Of course, these aren't regular people, Jennifer and Geralt. And of course, their relationship isn't regular. After they make love, Yennefer asks Geralt if he remembers their time in the mountains with Borch, also known as through Jackdaws. This is recounting The Bounds of Reason, which was episodes eight and nine with Anita and Carolina. And Yennefer recounts what Borch said to them at the very end of the chapter. She says, we're made for each other. Perhaps we're destined for each other, but nothing will come of it. It's a pity. But when dawn breaks, we shall part. It cannot be any other way. We have to part so as not to hurt one another. We two, destined for each other, created for each other. Pity. The ones who created us for each other ought to have made more of an effort. Destiny alone is insufficient. It's too little. Something more is needed. Forgive me. I had to tell you. And this is where you first get the idea that destiny alone is insufficient and something more is needed. We actually get it from Yennefer. And it does seem that Geralt ponders over and obsesses over this idea because it carries us throughout the entire rest of the chapter. Well, it's at least what Geralt remembers Yennefer saying. I don't know, uh, maybe at this point he's in trance, he's dreaming. Is he an unreliable narrator at this point, maybe? But that's a good point, though. We actually don't know if this is a event-by-event flashback or if this is somehow a convoluted, unreliable dream. Well, of course, he's dreaming exactly about the part that's important to him at the moment. Of course, you can argue, yeah, it's a book. It has to be the part that is important for this story. As you said, something more. This is the most important phrase in this short story. Yeah, I think at this point we haven't uh, heard uh, Yennefer talk about uh, destiny before, right? No. And it's interesting that you bring up this idea of an unreliable narrator, because at the very end, we get this very curious exchange between Geralt and Yennefer, and she begs him to ride to Sindra to claim his destiny. He's like, wait, how do you know about this? And she just says, I know everything about you. And it seems very weird when yeah, you're actually reading this is it. what I was thinking. Too. Of course, you could assume she was reading his mind again. And when reading his mind, uh, she would have stumbled upon the name Siri and Sintra. But, well, it comes from uh, nowhere, actually. Yeah. I also wonder if this was, let's say, a literal flashback and this really did happen the way that it's described. If she's just familiar with other courts, for example, given her position in Adern, or if it really just is that he's not a reliable narrator. I didn't really put that specific thought to the chapter, but it just felt off to me. Mm Mm-hmm. But she does say, ride to Sintra, go there as fast as you can. Fell times are approaching Geralt, very fell. You cannot be late. I don't know if this conversation is going to jump the gun, but when Yennefer specifically says that destiny alone for them is insufficient and that something more is needed, how do you interpret that in the context of their relationship? You're wondering, uh, what is this something more when it comes to their relationship? What is it? Maybe uh, she only says that you need something more as an excuse for never wanting to be together with him while knowing at the same time that there can't be a something more. You know, specifically between Geralt and Yennefer, my assumption was that it kind of came down to the idea of choice. Relationships need work and they need effort. You can't rely on destiny or however else you would describe it, fate or just passion or lust. Um, There has to be the effort and the decision and the conscious decision to choose that person every day. Mm -hmm. That's on my hinge profile. (laughs) Actually, it's totally on my hinge profile, at least in my understanding and colored by my own experiences. Something more for Yennefer and Geralt is in the choice. 
both of them are in their ways loners, lone wolves, no, no pun intended, of course. <laughs> when, when you're a loner, it's very hard uh, to let uh, somebody else into your life, even though maybe you love him, even though you maybe want to stay with him. But this is very tough for both of them, even though there's the spark, the sparks, they will always be flying when they meet each other. I think it's this classical story of they definitely want to, but they can't, they just can't. The end of this conversation about destiny isn't enough for us, and then also her plea for Geralt's ride to Sintra, close the end of this section. In part four, Geralt dreams of his final visit to Sintra, six years after Pavetta's banquet, as promised, to collect his child surprise. When the section first opens up, Geralt enters Sintra. There's a bunch of children playing around, and he's with Mausak. He's trying to figure out if Pavetta's child is amongst the children, and Mausak can't say, because Calanthe won't let him. We hear a little bit about what happened in the last six years since the banquet. The biggest thing, unfortunately, is that Pavetta and Dooney have died. Pavetta and Dooney had gone out to sea, and there had been a massive storm. None of their ship was found. Since then, it's just been Pavetta's child and Calanthe. There's this really interesting thing that happened in the translation to English. So for everyone who's reading an English copy of the book, this note is for you. When Malsak and Geralt start talking, Geralt tries to figure out which of the children in the moat playing is Pavetta's child. Malsak says he can't say... And Mausak says, when the child was born six years ago, she summoned me and ordered me to cheat you and kill you. And Geralt says, you refused? <laughs> Mausak says, no one refuses Calanthe. I was prepared to take the road when she summoned me once again. She retracted the order without a word of explanation. Be cautious when you talk to her. And in the English translation, it actually says, when the child was born six years ago, she summoned me and ordered me to cheat you and kill it. And kill the child. Which is incorrect. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calanthe wasn't prepared to kill her own grandchild just to spite Geralt. She wanted Mausak to kill Geralt to avoid giving the child away. <laughs> It's a very big difference. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. This would make for a totally different uh, story and would turn Calanthe's character uh, upside down. Uh, luckily, it's not like that. And luckily for Geralt, Mausak didn't go through with it. But it's interesting to note that he was prepared to. Yeah, he would have done it. Yeah, interesting. I wonder what that would have looked like had Mausak and Geralt actually met in that manner. Would it have been conniving and cheating? Would Mausak have just killed him? Or would he have like confronted Geralt and been like, I'm here because I was told to kill you. I'm going to do my best to. Uh, <laughs> This would make for a perfect short story. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's someone out there in the fandom listening that will be happy to write up a bit of fan fiction. We need this fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, right. I feel like I should compile all of the fan fiction requests across the episodes. Yeah. <laughs> We have quite a few that have like come up throughout the short story. There's so much not happening uh, in these short stories. We <laughs> actually have to see at one point. It's interesting because Mausak, as a druid, as somebody who's very close to nature, somehow personifies uh, the old ways. And the law of surprise uh, definitely belongs to the old ways. So, of course, he's in favor of it, I would say doesn't want to, uh, to get in its way. And we've heard that from Mausak before. Yeah, I think of in the short story that preceded this in A Sword of Destiny, Mausak said that at the very end when he and Geralt had met. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Mausak brings Geralt to Calanthe. Geralt notes that Calanthe is obviously a little older, has put on some weight since Pavetta's death, which is totally an unnecessary note. <laughs> Thank you, Geralt. Uh, yes. <laughs> He's like, her rings fit a little tighter, and it's like, dope. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Calanthe is understandably, I think, very hostile to Geralt because she's under the assumption that Geralt is preparing to take away her grandchild. She both praises and chastises Geralt for being so punctual to the six years that he promised at Pavetta's banquet. She apparently had done her research about what, you know, young children go through in order to become witchers through the trial of the grasses. She goes through this whole thing fantasizing about how future poets and storytellers will talk about their meeting of the evil witcher and the begging queen. And it goes through like this whole charade and eventually Geralt's like, if you don't want me to take the child, I won't take the child. It's a very interesting conversation between the two of them. Yeah, it's uh, one of my favorite uh, back and forths in the short story. When reading this and of course when reading their dialogue in A Question of Price, uh, you, you definitely get the feeling that uh, Calanthe and Geralt are very alike. 
when it comes to their uh, attitude towards life and of course towards destiny or the love of surprise they they're very much alike and this is why uh, even though of course uh, she's hostile at the moment towards Geralt uh, I think she deeply respects him for what he is not as a witcher but as a person I think Yeah, I think their dynamic is absolutely fantastic. Yes. And, you know, we did see it in A Question of Price. And Calanthe is very clever. We got to see that during A Question of Price when Dooney said, I can't take off my helmet before midnight. So she has a servant ring the bell to announce midnight an hour early. So he has mm -hmm. to take off his helmet then. And we see this cleverness again here in this short story, Something More, in which Geralt saw the 10 children down in the moat. And Calanthe says, if you really believe in destiny... And if destiny exists, you'll have one chance to choose the child that's meant for you, and you're going to take that child. It's putting him to a test, and I think it is a very clever test on Calanthe's part. There's nine boys in the moat and one girl, but a one in ten chance of picking the right child. Geralt says, how am I supposed to know which one is Pavetta's son? And he doesn't. <laughs> he has no idea which one's Pavetta's son. He takes a shot in the dark bets that Pavetta's son isn't amongst the children in the moat, and then Calanthe admits that Pavetta's son is not. They have a less hostile conversation. It's less about this queen and this witcher and more about, you know, two people trying to understand destiny, which is a huge abstract concept to try to unpack. Geralt kind of admits that, you know, it doesn't matter if the child is one of destiny or not. Ultimately, it's the trial of the grasses that decides and the physical changes that decide who ends up being a witcher and who dies. Calanthe is like, well, why do you bother forcing an oath like that onto people? Why do they create witchers out of this, like, grief of parenthood? I don't know. Um, Calanthe tries to challenge Geralt and asking, like, why do you want a child of surprise if there's no use to have one? We have this really excellent quote from her here where she says, let's ponder on the reason for your silence. Logic is the mother of all knowledge. And what does she hint at? What do we have here? A witcher searching for destiny concealed in the strange and doubtful law of surprise. The witcher finds his destiny and suddenly gives it up. He claims not to want the child's destiny. His face is stony, ice and metal in his voice. He judges that a queen, a woman when all said and done, may be tricked, deceived by the appearances of hard maleness. No, Geralt, I shall not spare you. I know why you are declining the choice of a child. You are quitting because you do not believe in destiny, because you are not certain. And you, when you are not certain, you begin to fear. Yes, Geralt, what leads you is fear. You are afraid. Deny that. The prose reads, he slowly put the goblet down on the table, slowly, so that the clink of silver against Malachite would not betray the uncontrollable shaking of his hand. Calanthe says, do you deny it? And Geralt says no. Well, yeah, she reads him like a book. <laughs> yeah, she scares him. <laughs> she yeah, reads course. straight into his fear. Like, he, he doesn't want to believe in destiny. And I think it's very much the kind of thing, well, you know, if you believe in destiny, then then what? Like, is this an idea of fatalism? Um, is this an idea that everything within your life is outside of your control? What is he subscribing to when he just says, yes, I believe in destiny or says, no, I don't? What I also find very interesting in this chapter, especially uh, at the beginning, she uh, chooses to use a fairy tale as a metaphor for uh, all these things that are playing out between uh, her and Geralt and of destiny. It's well, it's one of the biggest themes in the books, these fairy tales uh, gone bad or fairy tales turned around. And it's very interesting that uh, Calanthe does actually something similar in this dialogue, like Sapkowski himself. She tells the story, the classic fairy tale story between a witcher uh, demanding his child of surprise, uh, while at the same time maybe knowing that This won't play out like this. And of course, Geralt says, no, this won't play out like this because life is not a fairy tale. Of course, Geralt's opinion of life being a fairy tale is, of course, similar to his opinion of destiny. As a higher concept, this doesn't have any place in the world, at least in Geralt's world. Calanthe proposes the way that poets will sing of like the legend of Calanthe and Geralt. And Geralt's like, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he, he renounces that. In his renouncing of the child, there is a lot of fear from Geralt and also fear from Calanthe. This isn't an arbitrary decision, I think, for both of them. I think it's one of those things where he's afraid to know and afraid to not know at the same time. Yeah. You know, and Calanthe kind of turns around after Geralt renounces the child. She asks him, do you believe a child of destiny would pass through the trials without danger? And Geralt says, we believe such a child would not require the trials. 
And this quote ends up being rather important through the rest of the saga. And she says, is only the trial of the grasses hazardous? Do only potential witchers take risks? Life is full of hazards. Selection also occurs in life, Geralt. Misfortunes, sicknesses, and wars also select. Defying destiny may be just as hazardous as succumbing to it. Geralt, I would give you the child, but I'm afraid too. So we kind of see them both being equally vulnerable with each other, which I think we saw a little bit in A Question of Price, but not nearly as much as we're seeing now. And I guess you wonder, I think Cyprian did bring this up in A Question of Price, but like, how how does this law actually work? Yeah. <laughs> like, does Geralt actually have a right to the child? Is it Calanthe's right to say no? And this ends up being very similar to what we saw in A Question of Price, where it's the child's decision as to whether or not they fulfill their destiny and everyone else is just a player. But even here, you have Calanthe and Geralt deciding the fate of this child for it. Toward the close of the chapter, Geralt and Calanthe again level with each other. And Geralt says, For if destiny isn't a myth, I would have to choose the appropriate child among the ones you have shown me. But is Pavetta's child among those children? Calanthe says, Yes, would you like to see it? Would you like to gaze into the eyes of destiny? And Geralt says, No, no, I don't. I quit. I renounce it. I renounce my right to the boy. I don't want to look destiny in the eyes because I don't believe in it. Because I know that in order to unite two people, destiny is insufficient. Something more is necessary than destiny. I sneer at such destiny. I won't follow it like a blind man being led by the hand, uncomprehending and naive. That is my irrevocable decision, O Calanthe of Sintra. The queen stood up. She smiled. He was unable to guess what lay behind her smile. Let it be thus, Geralt of Rivia. Perhaps your destiny was precisely to renounce it and quit. I think that's exactly what it was. For you should know that if you had chosen, chosen correctly, you would see that the destiny you mock has been sneering at you. <laughs> you know, we as readers and Calanthe also know why this is fucking funny. Uh, yes. <laughs> Geralt assumes that Destiny, you know, as a witcher himself, has given him a boy. And he says that repeatedly throughout the chapter. The boy, the boy, the boy. But we learn in Sword of Destiny, the chapter that precedes this, that Pavetta and Duny's child is indeed a girl, Cirilla of Sintra, who Geralt eventually uh, meets in Brokolon. Yeah, this is uh, the matter of timeline. Uh, this chapter actually dates back to before this short story, Sword of Destiny. Uh, to be honest, when I read this whole short story for the first time, it confused me quite a bit, the whole timeline. And you're going to break that down for us, yeah. right, by the end of the chapter? At the end, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, yeah, so stick around uh, for the end of the chapter when Lars breaks down the whole timeline for us. Spoiler alert, it even gets more complicated. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> So that kind of summarizes Geralt's first visit back to Sintra after Pavetta's banquet. And in part five, Geralt wakes in the care of a healer, Visenna, who he recognizes as his mother. So this is not a flashback. This is not a dream. Geralt wakes up and he's being cared for by a sorceress that Yerga and his men were able to find to care for Geralt. But Geralt's mother does come up in his previous conversation with Calanthe when Calanthe is kind of learning more about witchers from Geralt. They have a conversation about, if you're looking for a child, why don't you just create one and then it'll have your own traits and predisposition toward the trial of the grasses. And Geralt says, well, I can't, I'm sterile. We do learn in his conversation with Calanthe that Geralt's mother was a sorceress. And we finally meet her here. And so does Geralt for the first time since their separation. Yeah, when I first read this chapter, I got the impression of her as an, I don't know, otherworldly being some angel-like creature who comes out of nowhere and heals Geralt and disappears again. Even though, as you said before, uh, this isn't a dream anymore and we're back into action with yoga in the background, you get the feeling this is still a, a dream-like sequence. Yeah, she's only there for a few moments, when he's awake at least, and uh, she disappears. Geralt's relationship with his mother is very complex. He told Calanthe that he was just a foundling, that despite what Mausak had said during A Question of Price, he was not a child of destiny himself. You know, the conversation between Visenna and Geralt Geralt's understandably angry, but also, I think, has a lot of adrenaline, despite how souped up he is on drugs. You know, this is his mother. This is someone who he struggles to remember but knows of. He recognizes her from just the color of her hair, which is described as fiery red. Like, it's interesting in, in his conversation with her because he almost seems to lose control a little bit. And it seems that, you know, he wants 
not necessarily to hurt her, but he tells her things like, how do my eyes look? Do you know what they do to get eyes to look like this? Vicenna refers to him as Geralt. He's like, Geralt, Vesemir gave me that name. Like, nothing about who I am came from you. And it turns out, well, one, that's wrong. Turns out Vicenna gave him the name Geralt. I think we might have learned this in A Voice of Reason in episode seven. Geralt does say that he learned to imitate a Rivian accent because Vesemir gave him the name Geralt Rivia. It seems like he has a lot of resentment toward Vicenna in this moment, and this is the only time that he'll meet her. Uh, I think it's very interesting that, uh, of course, he mentions Vesemir several times at this point. He was kind of a substitute father to him, uh, and Vesemir gave him as a substitute father what Vicenna didn't give him. Uh, you definitely get the feeling that Geralt uh, is much, much closer to Vesemir than he will ever be to Vizena. And this is, of course, because Vizena just gave him away. I think we have some interesting juxtapositions here where we see almost the outcome of a child that was given away. We see Geralt given away by Vizena. We also see, in one of the previous sections, Yennefer, who is also a sorceress, but who desperately wants a child. And then we see Geralt, who has a child, who has some child existing in the world, but he keeps punting her off and like brushing her away. It's very interesting to see the shades of parenthood across Vicenna, Yennefer, Geralt, and Vesemir even, like just even hearing about Vesemir secondhand, you know, what that looks like and also how it manifests for the parent and for the child. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. Uh, in, in the end of this chapter, um, when uh, Vizena vanishes again, she says something to Geralt like, um, you fall asleep again, and when you uh, awake, I will be gone. And uh, when reading this short paragraph, I got the impression that this uh, disappearance is very, very close to their farewell when Geralt was little and when she gave her away to Vesemir. Maybe it played out in a very, very similar... That's really sad to think about. Yeah, definitely a very, very depressive chapter. I mean, because we really have no idea how old Geralt would have been when he fell into Vesemir's care, but he must have been anywhere from like six to maybe 12. Yeah, right. Um, I wouldn't imagine he would have been older than that. Absolutely. I mean, we see here, you know, Geralt having a ton of resentment for his mother who gave him up. And we've seen him now twice renounce his child's surprise chronologically, first with Calanthe in that six years after Pavetta's banquet, and then second, during a sort of destiny, when he ran away from Ciri after their time in Brokilon. You know, it kind of makes you wonder about the feelings of being unwanted and how that kind of manifests, how trauma makes itself known in adulthood. I think it's interesting to see in contrast his relationship with his child surprise and Vicenna and Vesmer's relationship with him. At the end of the chapter, Geralt insists on seeing Vicenna in the daylight and looking at her and asking her a question. This is where she says, you'll never get the chance, but I'll already be gone. And before the Witcher wakes, we're going to hand it over to Lars in the future. Ooh, it's me. I'm from the future. <laughs> <laughs> for recent news on the Netflix show. And when we come back, present Lars and I will continue our discussion of something more. Hey, it's Lars from Witcher Flicks, and this is Tidings from Toussaint. There's a lot to report this week, so let's jump right into it. But first, let's look back on Season 1. In an interview with purefandom.com, showrunner Lauren Hisrick talked about two scenes that got deleted in Season 1. She said, We had a lovely scene in Episode 103, where Yennefer, Fringilla and Sabrina all discussed how they felt about their transformations, and looking back, I wish we could have kept it. It was such a gorgeous example of female friendship, and it also would have served to ground Fringilla a bit more before she joined Nilfgaard. We also filmed a scene of Yen meeting a very young Triss, who just arrived at Aretusa. It served to show how far Yennefer had come in her years at Aretusa, and created a sense of mentorship between these two sorceresses. Looking ahead to some stories unfolding in Season 2, I wish we still had those scenes. But I'm proud of what we've accomplished in the time we had. Well, maybe we will be lucky, and these scenes will see the light of day one day. Let's look into the future now. The much-anticipated animated Witcher film, The Witcher Nightmare of the Wolf, that will be released on Netflix in between seasons, has its first synopsis. It reads as follows. Long before mentoring Geralt, Vesemir begins his own journey as a Witcher after the mysterious Daglin claims him through the law of surprise. So we have our protagonist for the movie. It's Vesemir. 
I think it's very good news. I'm looking forward to see young Vesemir in action and see what he was up to in his youth. In other news, the filming of season 2 of The Witcher has finally started. We know that Henry Cavill has already filmed and trained together with his horses. Siri has posted her beautiful Roman-style sword on Instagram and Anya Shalotra has already appeared on forest sets. We also know now some new actors and roles for season 2 and there are definitely some fan favorites among them. Paul Bullion, known for Peaky Blinders and the Bastard Executioner, will play our beloved Witcher Lambert. Cohen, a Witcher from Kovir, will be played by Yasin Atur, an actor known for roles in movies like Robin Hood or Ben Hur. Danish actor Tu Ersted Rasmussen will play Eskel. Now only an actor for Vesemir is still missing. Arguably the biggest casting is Christopher Hivyu, who played Tormund Giantsbane on Game of Thrones. He will play Nivellen on The Witcher, the cursed man from the short story A Grain of Truth. Other actors include Agnes Bourne as Verena, a powerful Bruxa from the same short story, Aisha Fabienne Ross as the sorceress and Vilgefortz's assistant Lydia van Bredefort, and British model and actress Messia Simpson as the elven sorceress Francesca Finderbear. According to a list released by Rodanian Intelligence, we also know that several new characters will appear in Season 2. Among them are book characters like Vesemir, the mage Reens, the legendary elven healer Ithleen, and Redanian spymaster Sigismund Dijkstra. On this list there are also characters that have been created for the show. For example, a character named Gary, the younger brother of Francesca Finderbear, Vanessa Marie, a demon with the looks of an old woman, or Violet, a sadistic and smart girl. We will see what these characters will be like. In a statement to The Rap, Lauren Hisrick already commented on the new castings. She said, The reaction to season one of The Witcher set a high bar for adding new talent for the second season. Sophie Holland and her casting team have once again found the very best people to embody these characters. And in the hands of these accomplished directors, we're excited to see these new stories come to life. So, we already know the four new directors for season two that have been revealed by now. Every one of them will likely direct two episodes, similar to season one. These are the four directors. First, Steven Sergic, who worked on Daredevil and the Umbrella Academy. Ed Bazelgat, known for The Last Kingdom and Doctor Who. Sarah O'Gorman, whose work includes Jamestown and Cursed. And last but not least, Gita Patel, known for Meet the Patels and The Runaways. Beside these new characters, a lot of old ones will of course return. Obviously, Geralt, Yennefer, Ciri and Yaskir will return as leads. But we will also see again the sorceresses Tissaia de Vries, Sabrina Glavisic, Tris Marigold of Rangila Vigo, as well as the mages Vilgefort, Stregobor, Istred or Artorius Vigo and the elves Dara and Villa Fandril. In a podcast named Writer Experience, Lauren Hisrick talked about season 2 already. She said, Season 2 is exciting. It's a chance to look at the mistakes we've made in Season 1 and do it better. Tell stories better, improve some things, look at what didn't work, get rid of it and start over. The Nilfgaard armor will be totally different. You have that opportunity with Season 2 to go back and course correct if you want to. In the same podcast, Lauren Hisrick talked about her filming plans. She said, we are shooting Season 2 for about 125 days. So we go for about five and a half months, depending, give or take. Season one was much longer. It took much longer for us to do, but we feel for season two that we've got things a little more under control. According to Redanian Intelligence, we also know a little bit about what will happen in season two. Beside the adaptation of A Grain of Truth and a visit to Kaer Morhen, we also learn that a well-known and well-loved monster will make its appearance in season two. A Leshy or Leshen will appear in an episode and its encounter with one of the characters will have serious consequences. A Leshen is a forest monster appearing in the game The Witcher 3. It is also mentioned several times in the books. Anyway guys, that's it for me for this season. What a ride it was. I hope to hear from all of you soon in the next episode of Breakfast in Beauclair. Until then, thanks again for listening and good luck on the path. Hey everyone, welcome back from the break. I'm here with Lars discussing something more from Andrew Sikowski's Sword of Destiny. When we left off, Geralt saved a merchant, Yurga, and his wagon in the wilderness. 
Weak and feverish after sustaining injuries, Geralt dreamt of previous encounters with Yennefer and Calanthe before coming under the care of his biological mother, the sorceress Visenna. In part six, Back on the Road, Jurger recounts the Second Battle of Sodden and the 14 sorcerers who died on the hill defending the northern kingdoms. Jurger just gives like the spark notes version of what happened during the Second Battle of Sodden Hill. During the Battle of Sodden, there were 22 sorcerers who fought from the northern kingdoms, as well as, you know, anyone from, you know, soldiers, noblemen, and peasants who fought against Nilfgaard. And out of the 22 sorcerers, 14 died. And Jurger actually says that the people of this area have a lot of gratitude for sorcerers in general because of their place at Sodden Hill. He mentions that It's no feat for a soldier to fall, for that is his trade after all, and life is short anyhow. But the sorcerers could have lived for as long as they wish, and they didn't waver. You know, we just spoke about Beltane and how fleeting the human life can be. They took up their place in this battle. Yeah, but maybe they also knew at the same time that when Nilfgaard uh, conquers the north, their ways of life would change. Well, they don't really know what, when Nilfgaard reigns in Temeria or Redania, what would happen to the sorcerers and mages and uh, their importance and their influence at court. Uh, well, Nilfgaard would never let a sorcerer uh, have a say in their political decisions. Of course, uh, the sorcerers and mages aren't necessarily fighting for death, but they are fighting for importance and influence. We as readers don't really know too much about Nilfgaard at this point in the world, but we do hear kind of repeatedly throughout the short stories the brutality of Nilfgaard, um, and we'll hear a lot more about that in later sections of Something More, but it is absolutely brutal, the way that warfare is conducted between the northern kingdoms and Nilfgaard. The Battle of Sodden Hill, although we never see it in the books, we hear about it through flashbacks, we hear about it through um, secondhand tellings of either people who are there or, you know, people like Yerga. It does seem to scar the landscape and the people very much. Yeah, it's one of the decisive events in the history of the Northern Kingdoms. And it's grave enough that Geralt himself kind of bemoans the fact that he wasn't there. He didn't really know about it, supposedly. Uh, the Battle of Sodden happened a year before the events of Something More. You know, Jurga says, you must have heard about it. It happened a year ago. It was one of the biggest battles. And Geralt was like, uh, I was in the north. And it almost seems like he feels that he should have been there somehow. And the reason why is because he believes that Yennefer was there. And not only that she was there, but that she died. And this is something that haunts him for this section and the following one. At the end, we learn how much of an impact the Battle of Sodden had kind of on the local population. And Jirga says, Every child of ours knows the name of the 14 carved in the stone that stands on the top of the hill. Don't you believe me? Listen. Axel Rabbi, Triss Marigold, Atlan Kirk, Vaniel of Brugge, Dagobert of Vol, and Geralt tells him to stop. In part 7, Geralt climbs Sodden Hill to view the monument to the 14. As he reads the names of the sorcerers engraved on the obelisk, a girl approaches and takes the flowers left at the base. She is death, and Geralt confronts her. Jurga wakes Geralt, who had fallen asleep or collapsed at the top of the hill. Geralt climbs to the top of Sodden Hill, and he sees this obelisk, which we're told is enormous, so it must have been helped up there with the aid of magic. But before he's able to read the very last name, the 14, there's a girl that approaches. She's described as being barefoot in a simple linen dress. She was wearing a garland woven from daisies on long, fair hair falling freely onto her shoulders and back. He noticed she was not suntanned. That was odd then, at the end of summer, when country girls were usually tanned bronze. Her face and uncovered shoulders had a slight golden sheen. Geralt tries to make small talk with her, and it doesn't work. (laughs) Eventually, it kind of comes out that, like, she is the personification of death. And it's actually kind of beautiful, the way that the dialogue is written here. He was tranquil. He could not be anything else. Not anymore. I've always wondered what you look like, my lady. And she responds, you don't have to address me like that. We've known each other for years, after all. We have, he agreed. They say you dog my footsteps. She responds, I do, but you never looked behind you until today. Today you looked back for the first time. He was silent. He had nothing to say. He was weary. How, how will it happen? I'll take you by the hand, she said. I'll take you by the hand and lead you through the meadow into the cold, wet fog. And then, what is there beyond the fog? Nothing, she smiled. There is nothing more. 
the imagery of this being led into the fog. This is something that we're going to see in later books, at least the examples off the top of my head. We'll see in Tower of Swallows and Lady of the Lake, this idea of fog and the foreboding of death. Yeah, well, it was even in this story at the beginning of the short story when he was fighting the monsters. It was said that they were they came out of the fog or something. Oh, that's also true. Yeah. When she talks about there being nothing more beyond the fog, I think in The Eternal Flame with Garcinati, we talked about um, religions on the continent and if our main characters are religious at all. When she talks about there being nothing more beyond the fog, I wonder if they have like the idea of an afterlife or not. If there were or if there wasn't, if Geralt would believe in it either way. Uh, I wonder uh, if this is also uh, Andrzej Zabkowski's opinion towards an afterlife. Well, it's a very depressive one. Of course, and a very unchristian one, I would say. What's also very interesting is this uh, woman that the personification of death. She's uh, different to the classical Grim Weeper, Re, as a personification of death in uh, our own world. Have she's uh, well, she's a woman. That's of course the first difference. Christianity. I just assumed that he was a male skeleton. I don't know. Is there a difference between a male and a female? Uh, skeleton when it comes to mythology i don't know um i don't know about a mythology but physically yes yeah physically sh sure of course biologically uh but i don't know when it comes to uh, iconography or something like this well a skeleton is always a skeleton maybe it's neutral i don't know but well this is actually not what i was wanted to talk about uh the gender of skeletons when you meet the grim reaper it's grim it's dark it's uh, creepy well maybe as a child you're afraid of uh, depictions of the Grim Reaper, but when Geralt meets this woman, well, she's the opposite of that. Well, as you said, she's fair-haired, a garland woven from daisies on her head. She almost feels like a goddess of life, like uh, the goddess from the edge of the world. It feels kind of similar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she must look human enough that it takes Geralt a minute to actually realize who she might be. And I think it's only really from her demeanor that he's able to really guess. But it's a very accessible image of death. But it's interesting to see for Geralt, who's an older man, death being this young woman. You know, as you said, this is not a Christian death and afterlife. There's still kind of like the parallels to, let's say, like Greek mythology, where you have like the river Styx, you have Chiron, you know, you have someone leading you into the afterlife. That's still very much the same. I think it's interesting, you know, after all this time, we constantly hear the phrase, death dogs his footsteps. And we've heard this throughout the short stories. And here we, we see Geralt in this, you know, dream sequence or hallucinogenic state speaking to and confronting death in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And she's very straightforward about the whole thing as well. The other thing that comes up through this conversation is Geralt admits that he's afraid that Yennefer is the last name on the hill. And he assumes that she is the last person who died. This personification of death she doesn't confirm or deny this. She just takes the flowers that were left at the grave. Geralt says here, he's like, if this is true, I have nothing left to live for. Just take me now. And she just says, not now, but one day. He argues back at her. You've taken everything from me. And she interrupts him saying, no, I do not take anything. I just take people by the hand so that no one will be alone at that moment, alone in the fog. We shall meet again, Geralt of Rivia, one day. Knowing what I know about the rest of the saga, I find this passage, the imagery that this dialogue evokes, really, really interesting. I'm not going to say anything more, but... Right, right. Very spoilery territory. Yeah, right. we're in spoilery territory, so I'm going to, like, chill. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm definitely going to bring up this section of something more in future episodes of the podcast. Uh, what I wanted to add, in this uh, short paragraph, there's a lot of world building and a lot of background stories. Yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are some short paragraphs when Geralt reads uh, the names on the obelisk and he mentions a few uh, sorcerers or mages he has met before who are among the dead. Well, this is, of course, what makes him uh, think that Yennefer will be on this plague too. If you go through the names, you see Triss Marigold. He also mentions Litter Knight, uh, known as Coral. And actually, in this uh, uh, paragraph, that consists of about four or five sentences. You have the summary of Season of Storms that will be released, I don't know, about 20 years later after the release of this book. 
I imagine uh, Andrzej Zabkowski going back to this book, reading this paragraph and thinking to herself, oh, this is very interesting. Let's write a book about her. I can make money off of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Of course. And for all the listeners out there, as Lars said, that is Lydonette. Charlotte does have a fragrance for Coral in her shop. Oh, yeah. That is actually one of my favorite fragrances. Check it out. It's very beautiful. Um, there's also, if you'd be able to pull it up because I don't have in front of me, the section that he has about the sorcerer who wants his eyeballs. Yeah, old Gorask, who had offered him a hundred marks to let him dissect his eyes and a thousand for the chance to carry out a post-mortem, not necessarily today, as he had put it then. <laughs> and again, this would be a perfect short story. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so silly. I like the fact that Sakovsky includes, like, he wanted to do an autopsy and he would pay him for it, but it just didn't have to be today. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's one of these things where... As Anita and Carolina so lovingly put it uh, during our Bounds of Reason episodes, you know, you're reading something that's so grave and so powerful. Right. And then you mm -hmm. have a little giggle for yourself in the middle. This is, this is his style. <laughs> this is what makes it great, right? I like the fact that, like, obviously this would happen in this chapter because it becomes a summary of all the short stories. But I like that I'm able to reference every single episode that we've had. Yeah, you can talk freely. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. <laughs> but it's nice being able to be like, oh, yeah, in our conversation this person right. and that person and like uh. <laughs> it's good at the end of this section Yurga wakes Geralt up apparently Geralt had insisted on climbing the hill even though Yurga didn't think that was a good idea and then um, he either collapsed or fell asleep at the top which is why his dream or his hallucinating of death happened Geralt at this point actually does find out the last name on the hill and it is not Yennefer you know obviously we know how tumultuous the relationship is but You know, he was afraid of her death enough that he told, you know, at least his dream personification of death, like, I'm ready to go then. Bye. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. How how deeply he must care for Yennefer, how much he sees her as like an irreplaceable part of his life that he cannot move forward without her. It's surprising, I think. Yeah, uh, well, he's a, a lone wolf. He's a loner. And now he has found somebody and he throws all of this overboard for this woman. So it's actually so out of character, at least for the Geralt from before Yennefer. And this takes us to part eight. In part eight, on the road, Jörger reiterates his promise to Geralt, despite the witcher's attempt to put the matter aside. The merchant insists that he will not find anything at home, but is willing to give one of his sons to the witcher's guild. Geralt falls asleep again. This time he dreams of hearing about the fall of Sintra from Dandelion as the pair attempt to flee invading Nilfgaardian forces. Yurga and Geralt are just on the road. Yurga's having a chat. He doubles down on his promise to the Law of Surprise, which Geralt turns out, he's like, you know, come off it. Like, I don't want anything from you. And Yurga says, no, sir. Should I find something like that at home? It means it's destiny. For if you mock destiny, if you deceive it, then it will punish you severely. It just says, I know, thought the Witcher. I know. Yurga's insisting, though, like, I'm really not going to find anything at home. My wife can't have kids. Nothing's going to be there. But, like, I do have two sons. I'll have to get them apprenticed somewhere. I figured one could be a merchant with me, and I I'll need to find something for the other one. So why not a witcher? This exchange that follows is actually quite interesting. Yurga says, You had in mind a child for your witcher's apprenticeship and nothing else, didn't you? Why does that child have to be unexpected? Can it not be expected? I've two, so one of them could go for a witcher. It's a trade like any other. It ain't better or worse. Geralt responds, are you certain it isn't worse? Yerga says, protecting people, saving their lives. How do you judge that, good or bad? Those 14 on the hill, you there on that bridge, what were you doing, good or bad? Geralt says, I don't know. I don't know, Yerga. Sometimes it seems to me that I know. And sometimes I have doubts. Would you like your son to have doubts like that? And Yerga says, Why not? He might as well, for it's a human and a good thing. Geralt says, what? Yurga says, doubts. Only evil, sir, never has any, but no one can escape his destiny. Yeah, it's a summary again from at least this short story and the one before and a question of price, of course, because the three are so linked. Um, yeah, this is what destiny in the Witcher world is all about. It's not about good or evil or doing the right thing. You can't just escape destiny. I, I really like that section between Yerga and Geralt where Geralt admits to having doubts. Yerga says, like, that's not a bad thing. That just makes you human. I'm probably going to turn that into a good more and quote at some point. But mm -hmm. yeah. I find it incredibly beautiful um, when we talk about Geralt's struggle, also other people's perception of his humanity or lack of humanity. He admits to a very raw human emotion, just doubt. 
Yorga kind of says, like, that's that's a good thing. That's you're doing OK. Mm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's very sweet, I think. And I think says a lot, not just about the human condition as a whole, but the human condition in relation to Geralt. People are not even sure if he is human. Yeah, right. By stating doubting is okay, he actually calls him a human. And this is what we haven't seen so much in these short stories so far. There's so many bandits and brigands Geralt meets who call him a mutant, a monster, a degenerate or something like that. And now we have this poor merchant uh, just calling him, well, you're doubting, you're just a human. What's so bad about that? Well, this is very nice. And uh, yoga is definitely one of the well, how can you say it? Yoga's uh, very wholesome. <laughs> yeah, wholesome and good-hearted. Of course, there must be lots of good-hearted people in the Witcher world, but we, <laughs> we or Geralt uh, doesn't really meet them. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit unfortunate. Yeah. I guess if it was only a book of good people, I can't imagine much would happen. <laughs> yeah, sure. Of course, it would be boring, of course. But it's at this point, <laughs> it's very nice to meet one, especially for Geralt. Yes. Uh, that he meets someone who really cares about him. Even though he just met him, of course, Geralt saved him, but, well, he really cares about him and just sees him as a person and not as a witcher or a mutant. Yeah, there's a lot of desire to just do something good. Like, uh, like as simple as that is, I think, as you said, like, that's not always something that we see in the witcher world, and that's something we very rarely see in the witcher world. So to have someone, you know, a minor character like Yerga, who sticks out from the landscape, just simply due to goodness and integrity um, is something that it's really nice for Geralt to see and nice for us as readers. The scene between Geralt and Yerga is then followed by another, you know, flashback dream sequence, this time between Geralt and Dandelion. Geralt comes across Dandelion on a bridge fleeing the south. They're kind of coming across each other unexpectedly because Geralt is going in the opposite direction. Geralt is going toward the warfare to Sintra. Dandelion's insisting, like, no, we have to flee. And Geralt says, no, I'm going to Sintra. Dandelion says, Sintra's no more. What are you talking about? Geralt hears from Dandelion about the fall of Sintra. Nilfgaard surprised Sintra by surrounding the army in the Marnadal Valley. King Est, who we met during A Question of Price when he then married Calanthe, he dies in battle at Marnadal. Calanthe gathered the remaining troops and they fight their way through the encirclement and fall back toward the city. During this retreat, Calanthe is injured in battle. Eventually, they retreat back to the city. The Sintra nobility barricade themselves in the castle keep. After four days, Nilfgaard eventually got into the keep. They found no one alive. It says that the women had killed the children, the men killed the women, and then fell on their own swords. No one would kill Calanthe, so she flung herself off the battlements head first. Geralt can't really believe any of this from Dandelion, and we're not really sure why Geralt hadn't really heard about any of this. Um, I think it again says that he was just like in the north or whatever. He hears about Calanthe. He then asks about Calanthe's granddaughter, Ciri. Dandelion says, I don't think anyone made it out alive. Geralt then changes his plans and says, nothing's in Sintra for me anymore now. So that's kind of how Geralt finds out secondhand about the fall of Sintra. Yeah, and it says a lot again about Nilfgaard and their warfare and the cruelty. Well, it's especially sad because, well, we as readers have already been to Sintra. We've met uh, Kananthi again in this chapter and we know what this kingdom and the city is about. And even though we as readers haven't been there when Nilfgaard attacked Sintra, almost had the impression to have been there when Dandelion uh, retold this story. Again, it's only a few paragraphs, uh, especially in this short story. Lots of very, very important uh, content is only told in a few short paragraphs, but it doesn't diminish the impact of the things. It's interesting, um, one, because as you said, we don't actually get to see it, but we as readers still mourn because we're experiencing this with Geralt as he's experiencing it. The second thing is we didn't talk about this earlier. At the close of Geralt and Calanthe's flashback, Calanthe says to Geralt, I have a very curious sense of foreboding that this is the last time that we'll see each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it is because what follows is eventually the fall of Sintra. Geralt at this point believes that he's lost his child surprise. He had renounced her when she was six. He again let her go in Brokolon, um, and then eventually on his way, presumably to claim her. Maybe this is after Beltane when Yennefer was kind of begging for him to go. But if that was a real event, maybe he then was on his way to Sintra at Yennefer's behest. But on his way, he's then stopped because Sintra has already fallen. He's resigned her twice, and on his third time to actually claim her, he's too late. 
it's a very long build up to then something that he feels is now taken from him that he's lost. Well, at this point, from all the things Geralt has uh, said about destiny, you wonder if he feels uh, a weight being lifted from his shoulder. Of course, he doesn't want uh, this little girl uh, to be dead. But at the same time, he says, well, my destiny, it's gone and I don't have to decide anymore. And well, this is what you wonder when reading this. But at the same time, well, he, he's uh, obviously sad uh, from his short answers. When he talks to Dandelion, you get the impression that he's sad, even though this weight of destiny has been lifted from his shoulders. And I wonder if there's regret in that sadness as well. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Like if he said, I could have claimed her at six. I could have claimed her at Berkelon because... I said, no, she was there. She was at the fall of Sintra, and now she's gone. He feels responsible. I think so, too. By the yeah. end of the chapter, Dandelion has been begging Geralt to just ride north. And it's not until Geralt hears all of this that he eventually says to Dandelion, you know, there's nothing for me in Sintra anymore, which I think is very heartbreaking. I feel weird not reading out the very end of the chapter, even though that yeah. might take a while. But it's just so, I feel like I can't. I feel like I can't summarize it. This is the best part in the whole book, at least. It so is. <laughs> I, th I think you have to. I have to. In part nine, Geralt and Yerga reach the merchant's home, where they're greeted by Yerga's wife, who tells Yerga that she's taken in a young war orphan. The unexpected orphan fulfills Yerga's promise of a child surprise to the Witcher. The young orphan is a mousy haired young girl, Ciri, the princess of Sintra, who Geralt had denied twice before, in Berkelon and in his last visit to Sintra. The pair are reunited at last, and Geralt embraces his destiny. Uh, I was, okay, I was taking notes for this this morning, and when I pulled this quote and, like, reread it, I was, like, tearing. Yeah. The emotional payoff is so good in the books when you're actually reading all of this for the first time. Oh, it's so beautiful. Two books are uh, leading straight into this chapter, and it's so worth it. Perfect payoff, yeah. Yerga and Geralt eventually get to his homestead. Yerga's wife comes out to greet him, and she's actually referred to as Golden Cheeks. We actually yeah. never know her <laughs> name beyond that. This is absurd, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just totally very silly. Yerga asks after his sons, and Golden Cheeks says that they're doing very well. She tells Yerga that she also took in a young girl. And Yerga's like, oh God, like, I really didn't think I'd have anything at home, but now I have something at home <laughs> that I wasn't expecting. Oh my mm -hmm. God, this is the law of surprise. It's destiny. And he's bugging out because he and Geralt have been talking about this for days and his poor wife has no idea. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about that? The first little section? Uh, not really. It's really hard not to talk about the, the end of the story at this point. <laughs> So should I just finish it out? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yurgo's children and this war orphan come back to the homestead. Um, and I'm going to do my best to read this part out because I feel like it's not going to do it justice to try to summarize or paraphrase it. Um, hopefully I don't cry in the middle. <laughs> yeah, we'll just stop and you'll come back. Okay. So don't worry. Take your time. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Yurga broke off, seeing a small, very slim, mousy-haired creature walking slowly behind the boys. The little girl looked at him, and he saw the huge eyes, as green as spring grass, shining like two little stars. He saw the girl suddenly start, run. He heard her shrill, piercing cry. Geralt! The witcher turned away from his horse with a swift, agile movement and ran to meet her. Yurga stared open-mouthed. He had never thought a man could move so quickly. They came together in the center of the farmyard. The mousy-haired girl in the gray dress and the white-haired witcher with the sword on his back, all dressed in black leather, gleaming with silver. The witcher bounded softly, the girl trotting. The witcher on his knees, the girl's thin hands around his neck, the mousy hair on his shoulders. Golden cheeks shrieked softly. Yurga hugged his rosy-cheeked wife when she cried out softly, pulling her toward him without a word, and gathered up and hugged both boys. Geralt, the little girl repeated, clinging to the witcher's chest. You found me. I knew you would. I always knew. I knew you'd find me. Siri, said the witcher. Yurga could not see his face, hidden among the mousy hair. He saw hands in black gloves, squeezing the girl's back and shoulders. You found me. Oh, Geralt, I was waiting all the time, for so very long. Now we'll be together, won't we? Say it, Geralt, forever. Say it. Forever, Siri. It's like they said, Geralt. It's like they said. Am I your destiny? Say it. Am I your destiny? Yurga saw the witcher's eyes and was very astonished. He heard his wife soft weeping, felt the trembling of her shoulders. He looked at the witcher and waited. 
tensed for his answer. He knew he would not understand it, but he waited for it and heard it. You're more than that, Siri. Much more. Mm. Goosebumps. (laughs) I'm glad I got through my rendition of it. (laughs) Yeah, very good. What are your thoughts on the close of the short story compilations with the reunion? (laughs) What can you say? (laughs) Well, the the inner struggle of Geralt is finally over. He meets his destiny, his child of surprise, and he literally embraces it. When reading the short stories, especially the one about the law of surprise, you're rooting for Geralt uh, embracing his destiny. Well, they finally meet, and the words are so nice that it's uh, worded poetically. I think for me, the reason why the emotional payoff is so nice in this story, I think it comes down to Geralt's denial of her multiple Mm -hmm. times. Sure, of course. And I think this relates to how I personally interpret this idea of something more. Like, what is something more? And as I said in our conversation about Yennefer and Geralt, at least in my interpretation, you know, it's about the choice. It's about the effort and the hard work that it takes to build a relationship. So I find it very interesting that you have his denial of her in Sintra when she's amongst the boys, um, followed by the denial of her in Brokolon, and then the expectation that she's dead. He then invokes again this law of surprise, and then it turns out to be the same little girl that he said no to twice already. That's, at least for me, like what makes it so strong and so poignant. You can't escape destiny as Yoga said in the chapter before. And as Mount Sackett said at the end of uh, Sort of Destiny, he tells Geralt, like, you won't escape it. And Geralt's like, escape destiny? And Mount Sackett's like, no, escape her. Because <laughs> yeah. she's just always going to crop up. So something that you had brought up was actually the timeline of events that take place around this chapter. Did you want to talk a little bit about that and clear some stuff up? I think I'll give it a try. The timeline uh, is so convoluted in this short story, a little bit at least. And especially when it comes to other short stories that are deeply linked to this one. Throughout this whole episode, we mentioned uh, the sort of destiny and a question of price several times because they're so important for the overall story. Well, they are the foundation for uh, something more for this short story. I think the dates of these short stories are very important too. So, okay. Let's give it a try. We have some actual dates in the timeline of The Witcher. In Geralt lifetimes, we're in the 13th century. And um, from several hints throughout all the stories, you can, uh, well, at least guess. I I don't think that uh, even what I'm telling you now is is fact. It's only my guess, of course, because even Sapkowski himself, I would suppose, doesn't really know what the timeline is because he uh, doesn't really state it in any of the short stories or in the later books. So this is only uh, an educated guess, but let's start. I want to start my timeline with a short story, A Question of Price, and uh, the banquet at Sintra. This must have happened about September of 1251, and of course, uh, roughly nine months later, uh, in the night from the April 30th to the 1st of May, 1252, Siri is born. And then uh, we'll get straight to the first chapter of our short story, Something More. In 1258, Geralt goes to Sintra, Six years after her birth and to invoke the law of surprise. This is the meeting between Geralt and Calanthe we've talked about in chapter 4. Around four days later, in the summer of 1262, the short story Sort of Destiny happens. We know that Ciri at this point is 10 years old. Roughly a year later, uh, on the 1st of March of 1263, chapter 3 about the Beltani festivities uh, takes place when Yennefer uh, meets Geralt. And... She wants him to go back to Sintra, but unfortunately not even a a half a year later, in autumn of 1263, the fall of Sintra happens when Nilfgaard attacks Sintra. Then after attacking Sintra, uh, Nilfgaard heads north and uh, in late 1263, the Battle of Sodden takes place. After that, uh, in early 1264, uh, we go back to something more, to the chapter 8 where Geralt meets Dandelion at the river Yaruga, who tells him that Sintra has fallen. A few months later, in autumn 1264, we go back to the start of the short story. This is when Geralt and Yoga meet for the first time, and Geralt fights uh, the monsters and is gravely injured. Also, of course, in autumn of 1264, we go straight to chapter 2, well, it's a short one, where uh, Yoga helps Geralt, and Geralt falls into a deep slumber. After that, Geralt in chapter 5 meets uh, Visenna and is being taken care of. Then in chapter 6, 
Also, of course, still in autumn of 1264, Geralt and Yoga arrive at the obelisk on Sodden Hill. Then we go to chapter 7, uh, where Geralt climbs the hill to look for Yennefer's name and uh, he meets the personification of death. And then it's, of course, the final chapter in something more. It's the one where Yoga and Geralt have, uh, arrive at the merchant's home and Geralt finally meets Ciri, which is, again, uh, autumn of 1264. If you don't count in A Question of Price and The Birth of Siri, all of this short sort of destiny um, and everything that happens in something more happens roughly in the course of six years, six and a half years, maybe. It's great. I mean, the TLZR version is definitely, as you said, The Question of Price, The Birth of Siri, The Rejection of Siri, and then the outcome of The Fall of Sintra and like what happens after that. It's funny because all the way back in uh, episode seven, when I was talking to Crisanto and Jess, Crisanto had asked me, like, you know, what happened to Pavetta's kid? Obviously, that kid's coming back. And, you know, we get here, we see that, yes, the question of price kicks off this whole timeline um, and relationship between Geralt and that child. As standalone as a question of price felt when we first read it, it sets up the entire saga to come. <laughs> yeah, you would not have guessed it from reading it back in uh, your first episodes. Yeah, not at all. We don't really hear much about, you know, Calampi or Pavetta until we get back to a sort of destiny um, and and something more. So this is the last episode of the first season of Breakfast in Beauclair. What are your closing thoughts on all the short stories and on everything to come in the saga? <laughs> Well, it, it was a ride, I would say. <laughs> it was uh, so awesome revisiting all these short stories again. It was a few years back when I read, read all of them. It was so awesome to go back to them and read them again and discuss them. And, of course, listening to the discussions about them. Because there are so many insights I haven't thought about when reading the books. So many things to dissect. And I think there are so many things we haven't even mentioned in this episode. You could still talk about for hours and hours because the stories are so rich and so much mythology and so many deep characters with so many complicated relationships and uh, themes that are reappearing throughout the books. Of course, there's destiny, but there are so many other things. I think even today we mentioned stuff like parenthood, the symbolism of death and really, really grave stuff. And Sapkowski really manages to put his own spin onto it all and make it even more interesting because there, these topics are, of course, talked about so much in other uh, fantasy literature works, but it just feels very fresh in his stories. I think one of the beautiful things about his work here is that it wraps up the philosophical and the fantastical and the human, and it just ties it all up into this sprawling work. <laughs> It's such a joy to be able to talk about it and to be able to present it to other people out in the world. I think the fascinating thing about the short stories for me is that, as you said, like they are so rich and they create this huge world that we're just dropped into um, and we're kind of stuck with this strange kind of hero slash anti-hero, you know, Geralt of Rivia. And we get to see him, you know, at first as this almost stoic warrior hunting and fighting Astriga. And then we see his humanity kind of unfold over the course of these two compilations of short stories. We see the depth of his character, which I think is incredibly beautiful for someone who's perceived by the outside world as, you know, barely being human. Yeah, and it becomes this beautiful characterization piece of breaking down all these different sorts of people. It gets to be this very beautiful mosaic of the continent, um, which is why it's such a joy to read. So one of the things that I've been hearing from people who are new to the series is that they find the flawed nature of all of the characters really interesting. Of course, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's one of the beautiful parts of the short stories is that we get all of these shades of humanization and characterization, and we just get to, like, examine them and, like, nitpick at them and grow with them and love them. Yeah, right. It's really fascinating, the world that he even alludes to or hints at, even though we just get a small taste of it throughout the of short course, stories. Yeah. It promises a lot for when we actually jump into the saga, which makes it a really solid foundation for the next five books to come. Yeah, right. How are you feeling? How are, this is, it's heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Especially this short story is full of uh, deeper, darker tones and themes. But uh, I think these themes are necessary for this short story 
without these themes of uh, well abandonment for example or uh, death again this uh, end wouldn't be so powerful of course let's say for all the new people Lars <laughs> that might be listening to the podcast that are maybe reading along with us and haven't read the saga yet mm -hmm. what words of advice do you have for them before jumping into the saga wow <laughs> i think uh I remember when I finished uh, The Sword of Destiny, uh, the thing that I did was grabbing Blood of Elves and just continue. <laughs> just drop everything, just keep reading. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's the only thing to do, just reading all day, of course. <laughs> I think the advice that I would have for new readers when it comes to you know moving from the two compilations of short stories into the five-part saga, I mean, first of all, the saga is a series of novels. So the format does change. Yeah, when you get from the short stories to the saga, we are dropped into a more or less, you know, roughly linear story. But the characters are the same. The volume of characters just grows and grows and grows. Um, we still examine just as much of the human condition, I think, as we did in the short stories. But honestly, I'm so jealous of people who are reading yeah. it for the first time. It is such a joy. Like, I hope that for all of our listeners who are reading for the first time, that you really just, like, take it all in. Because when you don't know what's going to happen in the story, it makes it so exhilarating. It is a wonderful read the first time through and every subsequent time through, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, it has all the stuff that makes the short stories great. And, uh, well, it even improves them. There is something more, as you could say. Yeah, of, of course. <laughs> something ends, something begins. <laughs> of all puns that you'll understand. Yeah, after reading these books, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything else we could possibly talk about. Is this, is this it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, my God. I think we're through. A strange feeling, right? Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> it, it feels weird because like, this, is, this is the end of the season. So with that, I feel really emotional right now. <laughs> yeah. So with that, that is it for our show today. Lars, thank you so much for joining us for this episode and literally for every single episode. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. It was so much fun. Always taking part in your podcasts. I'm really, really looking forward for what it's about to come. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> yeah. So I guess just as a sign off, where can people find you? And is there anything that our community can help you with or anything that you'd like to share with them? Again, I'm uh, mostly active on Instagram. Witcherflix is my Instagram handle. Just hit me up, especially after you've read the books. Even though I'm talking a lot about the Netflix show, I will always love talking about the lore of the books, the stories, the backgrounds of the books, and of course about uh, the short stories. If you want to learn more about the short stories, I'll be really glad if you pay my Instagram page a visit. Lars is killing it right now. He's doing really, really well with Witcherflix. So definitely go visit his page um, at Witcherflix on Instagram. He shares all sorts of content, everything from news about Netflix as the Witcher, as well as lore, history of the Northern Kingdoms, monsters, all sorts of cool things. Um, and you post daily or multiple times a day, which is incredible. <laughs> yeah, I always try to post at least daily. And uh, well, if something news-wise happens in the Witcherverse, I, of course, post yeah this is daily for more than two years like lars is in it lars is doing really really well <laughs> oh thanks and if you're ever in berlin let lars and cypria know of course and maybe he'll talk you into going to some may day festivities too of course <laughs> <laughs> great so shoot so i guess this is it this episode completes season one of breakfast in beauclair covering the short story compilations the last wish and sort of destiny Season two of the podcast will premiere on Thursday, June 4th, with a discussion of episode one of Netflix's The Witcher, The End's Beginning. Thanks for joining us at The Breakfast Table. For show notes, transcripts of each episode, and a complete list of our social media platforms and listening services, head over to breakfastinbeauclair.com. Breakfast in Beauclair is created by Alyssa from Good Morning. It's hosted by Alyssa with the Titans and She Sant news segment by Lars from Witcherflix. The show is edited by Alyssa with the Breakfast in Beauclair theme by Mojo Filter Media and the Titans and She Sant theme by Bettina Kevamanes. Breakfast in Beauclair is produced by Alyssa in New York City with Louise of Covier, the owner of the Churlish Porpoise, Eric the Godling, Katie the Redhead of Toussaint, Jacob B. Mahakamelder Joe, Julie Sylvia, Skellige, Jameson, Ava of Gullet, Bee Haven of the Edge of the World, Jacob Meeks, and Sebastian von Novigrad. Special thanks to Lars for joining us for this episode and our international Hansa for their support.